fury in Spain after Catalan separatist leaders are sentenced to prison for a failed secession bid two years ago. So is the dream of independence for Catalonia now over? And what are the implications for the rest of Europe? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Spain's highest court has sent a strong message to Catalonia two years after the region tried to break away. Separatist leaders have been jailed to between 9 and 13 years for organising an illegal secession referendum in 2017. Former Catalan Vice President Oriol Junqueras was handed the longest sentence for sedition and misusing public funds. The nine leaders were acquitted of the more serious rebellion charges. Spain's Prime Minister says the verdicts confirm the end of a failed process for Catalan independence. Nobody is above the law. Nobody is above the law. In a democracy like Spain, nobody is subject to trial for his or her ideas or politics, but rather for criminal conduct as provided by the law. And the verdicts triggered violent protests in Barcelona. People blocked roads. Uh, the main road to the city's uh, airport and rallied elsewhere, denouncing the sentences as unjust. Al Jazeera's Sonia Gallego reports now from Barcelona. Hours after the sentencing of Catalan lawmakers and political activists were sentenced to years in prison for sedition over their role in the October 2017 illegal referendum, then there were mass protests across the city of Barcelona. The most tense points were in the city centre, but also at the airport. Uh, the protesters uh, had successfully managed to blockade one of the terminal buildings there. There were clashes between riot police and the protesters as well, who were demanding for an amnesty and for the release of those prisoners. Now, they see themselves as being part of what is being called a democratic tsunami. It's a leaderless organization that disseminates information, uh, points of reference and contacts and where to go via the social media networks. Now the Spanish government has reacted to this by saying it has already been monitoring this organization. The idea of any kind of amnesty uh, for the Catalan uh, imprisoned politicians and activists is out of the question. If the Spanish government thought that this trial would put an end to the tensions uh, that have been seen here in this region for the past two years, then the protesters would have proved them wrong last night. However, the question is, can they keep up that momentum? And what effect is it going to have on the region, but also on the politics of Spain as a whole? Spanish judges have issued a new European arrest warrant for the former Catalan president, Carlos Puigdemont, who's now living in exile in Belgium. He called the verdicts an act of revenge. I appeal to all Catalans, whether they support or oppose independence, that, above all, they value freedom and democracy and unite under a single banner and say, enough. I call on them to turn their indignation in the face of injustice into a positive energy that breaks down walls, that stops authoritarian regimes in their tracks. Let's bring in our guests then, who join us from Barcelona today. Elena Jimenez is head of the international team and board member of Omnium Cultural, a Catalan cultural association whose president, Jordi Couchard was sentenced to nine years in jail. And also in Barcelona, Christian Herbelsheimer, the director of the International Catalan Institute for Peace. Good to have you with us. Uh, Elena, where do these verdicts and the prison sentences leave the independence movement in Catalonia? Has it failed? Has it failed, the independence movement? Well, I do not represent the independence movement because Omnium Cultural has always done campaigning for democracy and, for example, for voting, for deciding things, for yes and for the no option to participate in a self-determination referendum. It's also clear that we are uh, part of the pro-independence movement, but 
our campaigns are, have always been for the for the democracy, which is now at stake in, in Spain, I would say. Christian, uh, has the independence movement in, in Catalonia failed? Does it have a future? The fury on display in Barcelona uh, is not uh, shared elsewhere in Spain or indeed elsewhere in Europe. No, actually not. Um, but this is a protracted conflict. It's been going on for many years in different cycles. Um, and um, I don't think that uh, what happened yesterday will signal an end to the independence movement. Rather, the conflict will take a different turn. And uh, therefore, um, there's still a need, maybe more than ever, to create the conditions that would allow for political dialogue to address a conflict, which right now are not in place, unfortunately. Christian, the Catalan independence movement has long been characterized by uh, its, uh, its peaceful nature. Uh, you say with the conditions not right yet for, for dialogue. Do you think that could change? Well, they will have to change. This is a conflict where it is difficult to foresee any resolution with a victory of one side and defeat of the other. At the end of the day, it is a common problem, both for pro-independence advocates and those against independence, or the conflict between the Catalan democratic institutions and the Spanish democratic institutions. There needs to be a way um, to address the grievances and to address the claims, the claims of legitimacy from pro-independent supporters and as well as those who oppose independence. There is, this is actually a conflict of clash of legitimacies and that can only be properly addressed if there is a political dialogue, which right now is not in place. Elena, what impact will this verdict have on the forthcoming general election uh, in Spain? Will it help the, the far right at, at the ballot box? Will pro-independence parties make bigger gains within Catalonia? I have no idea, but uh, the thing is that in every election, the pro-independence political parties in Catalonia have been winning votes. And also that um, the, what is important is that this is not about pro-independence or against independence, because a lot of people who is not for the independence was also demonstrating yesterday. So a lot of people in Catalonia feels that human rights are connected with peaceful assembly and freedom of speech. These are the, 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 the rights that are being now um, at stake, that they are being uh, condemned. So there's a lot of people who is not pro-independence that support these kind of demonstrations and that supports to, to ask for more dialogue, for more democracy and the capacity of decision of the Catalan people. Let's bring in a, a, a third guest. Uh, Enrique Usale Dacal is a senior professor emeritus at uh, Pompeo Fabra uh, University, and uh, he joins us uh, also uh, from Barcelona. Enrique, good to have you with us. Uh, professor, uh, Madrid based journalist and author Giles Tremlett, who was writing in the Guardian newspaper, said that the separatist yeah. leaders who orchestrated a head on collision with Spanish law required massive support in Catalonia, which they never actually had. Their real problem now, he said, is not the jail sentences, but hubris. Is he right? Uh, I would say that there is uh, definitely... It's an ongoing process. It, that's why the term process was coined. Uh, and the process has not culminated. It has not produced uh, a, such an awesome majority uh, the, so as to be victorious, but it doesn't disappear. And so it goes on. It's a kind of permanent tug of war. So what's the future for the independence uh, movement within Catalonia, Professor? Uh, short term, have to see what will happen in the upcoming uh, November elections uh, for the Spanish parliament. The Catalan elections are pending. And uh, there is some pressure, there's even debate within the independentist movement as to whether to go for elections or not. The leading parties in government are divided on this. Uh, it's hard to tell. Things are at a stalemate, and they've been at a stalemate for two years. Uh, 
it's uh, hard to know when that part of opinion that is very, very motivated is going to be overwhelmed or counterbalanced effectively by that part of opinion that is very tired of the whole thing. Christian, I, I saw you reacting there to what the professor was, was saying. Do you, want to, do you want to come back there? Well, I would say one of the, to frame the, to frame the problem, um, one of the, the, the crisis, the, the big root of the crisis is probably that, unlike other countries, um, pro-independence party are legal in Spain, um, but they have never been a majority. In 2015, for the first time, pro-independence parties win the elections in Catalonia democratically. They are elected. So the government and the parliament has a pro-independence majority, not in votes, 48% of votes, but yet, yes, in, in members of parliament. Um, and then there was no response, no political response from the central government to this fact. And that has, what we are dealing with now is um, the, the lack of political, even legal, I would say, um, frameworks and tools to address this reality of a democratically elected majority independence government putting out claims for a legally held referendum. Um, but these claims are not politically acceptable or interesting enough for the central state or the central government. And we're going around in circles um, addressing or not addressing this, this issue. And based on that, then, I would say there have been steps taken, obviously, by different um, political players, both in Barcelona and Madrid. And um, some of those steps have probably been rather unfortunate. Um, and what we need to find is a way out of from a, from a vicious cycle to some sort of virtuous cycle, but it looks difficult right now. How do you achieve that, though, Christian? Well, there is a... Obviously, first, there's a need of, 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 of some sort of agreement of what the conflict is all about. Madrid says it's an intra-Catalan conflict, um, and that's partially right. There is half of the population for independence and half not in favor of independence, but that's only part of the picture. It's also obviously a clash between Catalan and Spanish governments, but it's also a, a deeper clash, I would say, like Elena just mentioned. It's not only about independent, Catalan independence, yes or no. It's how does civil society, how does society relate with the government and with the state institution? Is it legal to demonstrate um, and, and to protest um, laws which um, parts of society may not agree with? And, um, and, 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 and therefore, um, right now, it's not all, the framework is not only about Catalan independence, yes or no, it's about um, the, the level of um, capacity of the democratic institutions to deal with dissent. Elena, coming back to the, the, the trial and the, the Supreme Court uh, verdict, uh, in which Omnium's chairman was uh, sentenced to nine years in, in prison. The former president of Catalonia, Carlos Puigdemont, now in exile in Belgium, uh, says that the sentencing of his colleagues came at the end of an unfair trial by a politicised judiciary. Is he right? Yes, completely. And it's, only, it's not only him saying that or us saying that. There was a platform and, uh, who was observing the trial, an international one, so with many NGOs, and they have released some statements saying that there were uh, severe irregularities during the trial. It has been Euromed rights, the Federation International of Human Rights, so it, it's not only the civil society in Catalonia, but it's also NGOs on human rights that are saying that the trial was political. And moreover, um, some other NGOs on human rights like Amnesty International or, or World Organization Against Torture or Frontline Defenders, they have asked the release of these um, prisoners, especially the release of uh, the two social uh, civil leaders, and they have asked that the charges are dropped. So um, it's it's not only a matter of concern inside Catalonia, not even inside Spain. It's something that is affecting all of us. OK. Elena, the law, though, was deliberately broken. The Catalan Parliament doesn't have the power to call a binding referendum on independence or to declare independence. 
I mean, as Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson found out, when politicians flout the law and act unconstitutionally, the courts will act. And that's just what's happened here, isn't it? No, because there are a mechanism in, in the Spanish constitution, as in many other constitutions, that establish that, I mean, every parliament can adopt a law that is non-constitutional. That's why you have the constitutional court to say that this is not constitutional. So you have the mechanism, the legal mechanism and so on. But what cannot be forbidden is that parliaments discuss and, and, and on everything and that they can have the freedom of speech. So what it cannot be, if a law is not constitutional, there are the mechanisms to consider this not to be constitutional. And, that, and that's the point. But it's not about providing uh, the debates or the dialogues inside the parliament. This is not about democracy then. Enrique. Cons in con unconstitutional laws are adopted everywhere, uh, every day. Uh, then there are the mechanisms to 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 fit this to constitution. This is not the problem. All this crisis is not a legal crisis. This is a political crisis. Okay, Henri, we'll, we'll come on to the constitutional Please. and the political crisis in just a moment. I just want to ask you a, a question: Why was the Spanish far right party Vox allowed to take an active role in the trial and to question witnesses and defendants? Uh, because when uh, the uh, entire state system is reorganized in uh, what's called habitually in Spain the transition, 1977-1978, uh, there is a provision which allows for independent uh, participation, independent accusation, uh, citizens who choose to participate in the trial. Uh, and this is a recognized force. It was unfortunate that Vox took advantage of this, and the unfortunate aspect was even indicated in the trial sentence. Uh, it was uh, uh, remarked that it would be better if legal measures were taken so that political parties could never in the future participate as uh, private accusation in trial. But, but surely that means that, that, that this trial was not uh, uh, free and fair in, in, in that case. Uh, it was just simply that uh, it's like uh, all other trials held in the last uh, uh, 40, almost 50 years. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there is, since the late 70s, uh, the provision that you have... Uh, a private uh, right in any case, meaning uh, in a murder case, uh, in any uh, penal uh, procedure, you, there can be a private accusation together with the public ac accuser. Uh, Christian, this uh, is the way the system was established. Yeah, Chris, Christian, uh, Carlos Puigdemont says that his colleagues are political prisoners, and, and as Elena was saying. Earlier on uh, this year, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention held that the pre-trial imprisonment of the nine politicians was a violation of international law and that the imposition of any prison sentences at the end of the trial would also violate international law. Spain says the UN Working Group is biased and has ignored its ruling. Uh, so who's right, Spain or the UN? Well, this is a political battle. As Elena said, it is also a legal battle. And the battle is fought at different fronts, at the internal front, um, to see who has the upper hand in terms of legitimacy, and very much also on, on, on the international front. You could see the same day of the sentence yesterday, um, Spanish government, members of the cabinet, distributing a video highlighting the, the, the health of the Spanish democratic system, which is obviously part of an international campaign to strengthen an image that is being challenged by, to, to some degree by the pro-Catalan movement. And that's part of the political battle that's going on. Um, we as an peace institute, we don't focus on the, on, the, on the political battle in terms of seeing who's right or, front or, or wrong. What we try to see is um, to analyze what are the possibilities of finding a way out of this. Right now, in this political battle I mentioned, um, essentially um, what's happening is a, a battle to delegitimize 
the other side. So yesterday, President Sanchez um, said that um, the Catalan independence movement had failed and um, had been defeated. At the same time, um, from the, in the protests against the sentence, you would see many people trying to suggest Catalan, sorry, Spanish, Spain and Spanish institutions are a fascist yeah. state. So this is the level of okay. political confrontation we are we are facing, and it can go on for for very long time because right now there are not many political incentives yeah. to move away from this. What's necessary is to find a way of um, of, of getting out. Elena, um, the jailed Catalan leaders say that they're going to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, is there any reason to think that that court may take a different view to Spain's Supreme Court? And does it matter if it does? Yes, it does matter. Yes, and and it, we are quite sure that it will take a different position because um, it's it's about freedom of expression and, and the right to peaceful assembly, and these rights cannot be um, limited as they have been limited at that moment. You can say that the, there were civil disorders or things like that, but you cannot condemn uh, with sedition and then put people in prison for nine years. That's that's nonsense. And moreover, legally, yeah, the jurisprudence of the of the Strasbourg Court uh, it says many other things. It says that uh, peaceful assembly and right to free of expression must be respected. And uh, so I'm sure that we will end up in, in this situation. But the problem is that it will take long. And what do we do during all this time? I mean, this is a very big political crisis in Spain. And we cannot leave it to the, constitu to the constitutional court first in Spain or to the, uh, to the court in Strasbourg. That's not the solution. This is part of the solution in the sense that it's the international community saying things. But the problem in Spain, uh, it will be going on if this is not uh, solved in a dialogue so that politicians sit and talk to each other. Enrique, we've got about two minutes left on the programme. I'm going to give the last word to you as you, you, you joined us uh, late. And I need you, if you can, to answer two questions at once here. Uh, why have Belgium, Germany and Scotland thus far failed to extradite, uh, uh, to answer the extradition request uh, uh, from Spain for uh, Puigdemont and, and, and his colleagues who went into exile? Is it because they recognise that these are politically motivated charges and not criminal offences that they've committed? And what are the implications of this verdict for other separatist parties across the continent, in Scotland, for example? Uh, the different uh, German, Belgian, uh, Scots courts did not accept the initial accusation of rebellion, which was uh, what was drawn up by the investigatory uh, judge, which is the equivalent of uh, uh, a uh, attorney general figure in uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon courts. Uh, so. The whole question fell back on sedition. Uh, it's now been re-requested for Puigdemont to be for, by the same investigatory judge, okay. uh, especially in Belgian courts. All right. Uh, and the but implications? Sedition is undefined. Yeah. Implications. Yeah. Uh, sedition is very problematic. It means two different things. It means uh, actually aggregate, aggravating and creating some kind of riot or it means uh, doing so by propaganda. So there's a sign to the problem that always affects and always has affected the question of freedom of speech. OK. Uh, so there, I, yes. it will just go on. OK. There, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it. Thank you all for being with us uh, today, Elena, uh, Enric and Christian. And uh, thank you for watching, as always. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. Uh, for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.